Hello everyone, today is uh, August 10th, 2022. My name is Tatiana Zaitseva and we are on Natural Pigments Studio and uh, as always, Georgia Handland behind the camera helping me today and um, uh, we have exciting um, program today and we missed you for whole months and uh, I would love to tell you then we had the vacation but we didn't we still working on website on new website and so hopefully it will be done by next week and uh, so it looks like we will have a special program for that and uh, but today we will talk about how to varnish your paintings and um, so I think like three biggest uh, questions we always have um, uh, people call to uh, to uh, to us it's uh, of course oiling out the mediums and of course the big one is varnishing and um, and as um, our newsletter was saying then everything almost everything what you see on uh, internet sometimes looking horrible or horrifying and so then today we will show you right way how to varnish and uh, we will not touch uh, much the um, the scientific part of um, uh, of varnishing if you are interested in that we covered much more in uh, last year program if you will look i believe it's uh, uh, may 12 2021 and it was guide uh, to varnishing and so we were talking about all different resins and uh, or all different solvents so today we will just quickly remind you and then we will int uh, introduce our guest for today and uh, so and um Stay until end of the program because on the end of the program we will uh, have a special promotion for next week for only for people who are watching program today and it will be discount which we are uh, not often doing so anyway uh, let's cover our products first so then because when we will talk to our guests so then you at least have the idea what we uh, what he's talking about oops where I am okay let's do <laughs> I just wanted to show the full uh, line there full, oh, okay okay all... here here <laughs> full range full okay. range <clears> of, <throat> um, of varnishes so again, I, I want to remind you, so then uh, we have varnishes probably last uh, four or five years. We didn't have varnishes on our, uh, on our line of the colors. And uh, more we travel with our classes, more we explain people how to varnish. Uh, the question often was with what to varnish. And of course, uh, many of you know two or three varnishes although it's a lot of them in market but um, and you stuck with them and uh, for some of you it works beautiful forever and for some of you uh, you are greatly disappointed and you think then it's something about the product itself and so then uh, again I, I want to remind you very often it's not about the product but uh, how it was applied or what happened to that product while it was staying 10 years on your shelf okay so let's um let's cover quickly our line of um, our line the ruble of uh, colors and so then first would be uh, all of them this area is conservar varnishes and so why we call that because we borrowed that formulas from uh conservators world and um so a lot of the formulas are, are based on what, uh, of course, conservators use a wide range of formulas because they, they customize the formula for each painting or application that they're using. But in general, there's a starting base formula. And so we, we base these uh, and they're very, very simple type formulas. And of course, all of them have UV stabilizers, which we'll talk uh, we'll have a question about that. We'll By talk the about way, yesterday when I looked at programs specifically for 
just to verify what did we show because it was a year ago so uh, we almost forget what was the program and uh, uh, on couple occasions I said their protector UV protector it's not what uh, what is inside the tube it's actually UV stabilizer and we will specifically talk about this too so then uh, I probably like sh to sh sh should have disclaimers I'm like oh don't do that so anyway um, isolating finish and varnish uh, based on Larapal uh, um, resin and um, so it's a Larapal A81, A81 resin it's made by BASF and um, it's it's been used in in uh, on, in conservation for at least uh, three decades. Um, and so it, it has a good, a fairly good reputation in terms of longevity and uh, long life before, and before they, you know, tend to, all varnishes tend to yellow, get dirty, uh, and they eventually wear out. Uh, that's just a natural process, but but they're longer life than yes. the natural resin. This is synthetic resin. Why we call isolating finishing? Because it's not isolating. Please don't take this as a isolating in between layers, of which paint. never, yes, <clears throat> a yeah. layer of paint. Never, never do that. <clears throat> uh, but meaning isolating, so that could be just first uh, layer if you do need to, if you're, you have an even sheen on your uh, painting, so then that Larapal is covering very well uh, all imperfections and so then you can just do that first layer uh, as the isolating var uh, layer and then you can do finishing varnish you can use exactly the same varnish or you can use what we have we call uh, finishing varnish so uh, George let's skip to uh, next photograph so that how it's look like so it's uh, very matte on the first layer and again i always <clears throat> careful to say matte or glass because uh, even today we will show you how the same varnish on different paintings can look different and that's all about not only application but the surface if it's canvas or if it's board uh, or even more uh, the structure of your painting if you paint uh, very thinly or, or if, you, if you apply paint uh, very thick so again uh, that uh, photograph we borrowed from the previous program and so you will see then the first coat is uh, quite matte then if you will put the second it's becoming glossier so then so it, it is a gloss varnish uh, it's just uh, what you're seeing here is is uh, it applied to a standard surface and you can see that as you put more coats on obviously it gets it yep. becomes more glossy but the, it is a gloss gloss, gloss varnish. varnish but Just again when you to compared to, to the mar what we will show you a little yeah. bit later so then this is not as so okay next one finishing varnish that uh, is based on regal res and so that is your most common varnish and so then uh, probably from another company uh, you are accustomed to uh, to here as a gum var and uh, so we call this regal res finishing varnish and again it's glass uh, glossy uh, varnish and uh, George you show uh, next uh, how it's look like so that's how uh, one coat and two coats look like and uh, I do want to remind you, so then if you put first coat with this specific varnish, the second coat will very well picked up uh, first one because it's, um, it's it, again, we explain on first program, it's good and bad to have that, that great uh, resin because it's very easy removable. This is great. But same time, if you're putting second layer and if you're putting second layer with the brush, so then you picking up the first one because it's dissolving immediately. So uh, in order for you to properly put good uh, second, var uh, second layer of the varnish, if you do need uh, the second one, it's better to spray the second one. Okay, let's go. And next again, one. what you're looking at is a reflection of a light 
in, oh, yeah. in a okay. black card. Yes. Just just so that people understand what they're looking at. And you can see the 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 more clear that light, in other words, the the the, the better image it makes. Uh, then uh, that's yeah. There, I usually Tanya is holding up one of the, the one cards, of these kinds of cards. I can't and, um, find every time. Like okay, here. Yeah. Okay, yeah, like, right. it's like here. And so um, uh, the sharper the image yes. of the light, the, yes. that means it's it's glossier. So the more yeah. diffuse, uh, it's less glossy. So the next one is the mar varnish, and um, again. When you call us, we usually try to uh, to so like um, move you away from the mar varnish because the longest time um, it was the probably only mastic and uh, and um, the mar varnishes uh, they yellowed badly in uh, in past. Uh, history, but since now we have UV stabilizer, you see that's written there UV stabilizer. <laughs> so it's prolonging the life uh, of brittleness and the yellowing this varnish. Nevertheless, it's still um, yellowing and um, uh, crosslinking much faster than other like two synthetic, yeah. synthetic ones. So um, therefore, Again, if you like very, uh, you can switch the show uh, we will uh, talk about. You see how that one is glossy. So we do have customers who absolutely want to be, you know, um, glossy surface and uh, they, they want to see every detail on, uh, on their painting. And so that's, uh, that's the Mar Varnish. Uh, for us, of course, it was important to do because we do make this uh, varnishes for conservators and so and people who are restoring and so because... Um, and and uh, Dammer Varnish, and I, I pronounce it Dammer, but uh, a lot of people pronounce it Damar, but uh, Dammer Varnishes uh, are still very popular. I know. And, and, That's uh, why we're making. And <laughs> even and even in Europe, yes. uh, many uh, many conservators still use uh, dammer varnish uh, because they're not convinced about the synthetic varnishes. So it's just, and of course, most importantly, why they they use it is because the artist originally may have used a high gloss varnish like dammer or mastic, and so uh, and and it has the same type of gloss. Dammer actually, like Tanya mentioned, has has the highest gloss of of uh, all the varnishes, synthetic and otherwise. So, on to the next one. Yes, uh, polymeric isolating varnish, and uh, this is interesting one. And so, from uh, all our varnishes, that probably the most um, matte looking varnish. Less gloss. That's less probably gloss. A better... <laughs> it's still okay, gloss. less gloss. It's still gloss, but it's just I less. I will show you how. Less, it's... Uh, well, yeah, I know. It's, okay. it's, it's, it's all subjective. But... Okay, okay. So, <laughs> but we measure every time, it, again, yeah. uh, remember, so on the first program, we, we showing you the gloss, uh, uh, the um, numbers, or how is that? Uh, well, yeah, we, we yeah. measured the gloss. Uh, with a gloss meter, yes. so that you can, so you can actually get a quantifiable difference there instead of a subjective difference. But yes, it, it is, it is still glossy, but it's much less gloss. But and can, uh, yeah, and I, here you see, like, uh, and I think you have uh, uh, one slide where all of them together, yes, so then people right, can with, see uh, that based on two coats. So yeah, yeah. okay. So um, interesting one, uh, but uh, you need to remember here a little bit more aggressive uh, the solvent. So uh, again, every time anything you buy from any company, <clears throat> first, uh, uh, if it's new product for you, please try this something uh, on some. Test it. Uh, yeah, on yeah. some paintings, what you know you will not sell. So, but you can at least test it. And so then you will see, because uh, it will be based on your techniques, on your uh, apl applications. So, so then, like I said, for somebody that, that varnish will look like very matte, for somebody will say like, Jesus, that's very glossy varnish. So next one. Yeah, just keep in mind, this is based on uh, the acrylic resin, uh, Paraloid B72. 
very stable resin, probably, uh, and also used in conservation. Uh, and we called it cons uh, conservar polymeric isolating varnish, but it can be used both as a first layer and also a final varnish layer. And the last one is acrylic varnish. And so uh, this is based on Perloid B44 and George specifically created this one uh, while Artifacts uh, was started uh, selling the uh, copper panels. And, um, and that was the big trend of uh, where uh, artists wanted to paint on, uh, on copper, leaving copper metal um, visible through the paint and so or on or some just areas bare. just bare and uh, unfortunately uh, every time when you touch the the uh, copper panels or uh, with the time and especially if depend it's depend where uh, your painting will be and if it's uh, somewhere on florida and very salty humid uh, um uh, air so that will not do very well so you absolutely need to uh to cover uh, copper with the um, acrylic varnish specifically this one works very well but uh one problem so uh some some colors could be uh too uh too weak or too um um too softy <laughs> for the uh, acrylic varnish because uh, um, it's very aggressive. So uh, be careful the sol again. The, the solvent is, it's a powerful solvent, but yeah. uh, applied on a well-aged paint layer, yeah. uh, it, it, it should do fine. So next, yeah. And you can see the uh, relative, very similar to the B72. But a little bit, yeah. 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 And by the way, this is, um, uh, this is actually a reformulation of the famous um, varnish called Incrolac. So we we did a couple of different things to it than the base, the original formulation, which is has an excellent reputation of protecting uh, copper. Uh, that's one of the reasons why it was originally formulated, and um, and and the. And it's been around since uh, at least the 1960s, the Incrolac uh, formula, and Paraloid B44 has been around even longer than that. So uh, it's, a, it's an excellent varnish, especially great on, on bare copper uh, surfaces. Uh, that gives a lot of protection there. Yes. So here is the comparison. Uh, cup uh, what, okay, I'm going again wrong. So this is uh, Conservar on the very bottom. Bottom. The first, the first coat. No, on the well, the first coat. So we applied one coat of the isolating finishing varnish. Larapal, okay, Larapal. So that was uh, uh, on all of them. Mm -hmm. God damn it. Um, so, uh, but then, uh, so on the the uh, the very top one is polymeric, and then uh, you see acrylic, and you see how that is. That is. Jesus, I can So anyway, <laughs> my camera is up, uh, the reverse. So then, and then the Mar varnish, you can see how that is glossy compared to any of that. And uh, so Regal Rest, you don't see very well, but I can tell you this, it's uh, somewhere uh, in between the Mar and Polymeric. So it's, uh, it's not as glossy as the Mar, but. Pretty close. Yeah, it's, so, pretty, it's pretty close. And um, anyway, um, I think, I think I would love now, George, introduce our uh, guest because this is exciting part of uh, of our program, and uh, we are waiting right now for uh, Eric Johnson. And um, can we? And I'm Eric uh, is a Boston-based painter and instructor at the Academy of Realist Art. We still in Boston. can see him. And I'm going to bring him on. Okay. Right now. Okay. There he is. <laughs> Hello. We did it. We did it. Hi, Eric. So happy right. to be here. We had a little little difficulty in the beginning, uh, but uh, but we're, we've uh, squared away all the technical issues. So okay. uh, and Eric is um, uh, Eric has has been uh, making his own paints. Um, he does he does use uh, Rublev paints too, and uh, but uh, and I think that uh, that's been a. a uh, an important part of your entire painting career because it's it's 
obviously changed how you view paint and and uh, mm -hmm. and how you work with it too. And and it's uh, it's it's very apparent in in your work. So we we welcome you here, and we wanted to welcome you to. See, you know, talk about some of the, uh, your, your varnishing tips and tricks. And um, so we will, we'll get right into that. So welcome, Eric. Thank you. All righty. So should I, should I just go and just start rambling? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Very yes, good at it. it. Very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So just to give you, you all who don't know me, um, just some, a brief history. Um, I, really admire the old masters, although I believe it's our kind of our objective to take a step forward in the train of in the chain of tradition, not just do the things that the old masters did just because they did them. But I, I eventually realized that common manufactured paint was just not giving me the same um, look of the old masters paintings that I knew and loved and admired. That led me to and down this big rabbit hole of making my own pigments and making all of my paint, um, doing, the, doing the research to avoid uh, stabilizers and additives and all the slew of terrible things that they can do to the longevity of the picture, but also the quality of the paint while it's actually being used. So I, I, I've been at, at, this, at the Academy, I'm, I'm kind of known as the materials guy because I just, I just deep dived into it. Now, the main, my main objective as a, as a painter beyond my own kind of aesthetic ideals and everything is to make sure that my painting lasts the test of time. So I, that's one of the main reasons why I use paint without stabilizers and additives is because I want my paint to just be linseed oil and pigment based. Um, and that's it because I feel that that has the greatest possible benefit, even the amount of yellowing. And you really look at the difference between walnut and linseed oil. The pros of linseed oil outweigh some of the cons of walnut oil. Now, throughout my through, throughout my entire painting, I look at it as a little chemistry experience or experiment, and I want my painting to be um, really well aging while I'm alive, but also very easy to take care of later. And, and that's why I choose to varnish the paintings in the way that I do. I personally now prefer to use Regal Res 1094. Um, that's going to be your Conservar finishing varnish. And one of the main reasons I choose to use that varnish is uh, the amount of gloss, you know, the amount of gloss units is still fairly high. I can make my, I can make my varnish a little bit more glossy if I just increase the, um, uh, the concentration of mm -hmm. resin just, just a little okay. bit and not thin the varnish down if I'm making my own. So I really like to use the Conservar uh, varnish kits. That way, the UV stabilizer, which in this case is Tinuvin, oh, what is it, 292? 292. Mm -hmm. 292. Um, that way, I can use, I can make the varnish in small batches and use that within a month. And I love that there's um, there at the top of the jar, there's a little thing that I can write what the age of the varnish is, because I want that UV stabilizer to give my give my varnish the longest lifespan. So the UV stabilizer obviously is not going to protect, you know, the painting necessarily from 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 UV rays in the in the way of so something special, other than the fact that you know varnishes will peck, will protect the painting from um, from UV light, ultraviolet light. But the UV stabilizer is really going to protect the longevity of the varnish. So it's very important for me to know that that is pretty fresh. And that's why I like also when I don't have the time to do that, I can just buy one of your varnishes that are already made because I know they're made in small batches and small and small bottles where I know when it was made. I know how quickly to use it. You did all when my varnished, job, you know, you, you just, you know, <laughs> I, could, I should hire you <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I just had this uh, uh, set and you already said exactly what I would say then because on the jar there we have special label where you mix it at the same like at the time so then you can exactly know what the date on that and we put specifically although it's uh, it's look like half of the jar but uh, or bottle but it's exactly amount for exact amount what we measure uh for that one 
you know time or not one time use but one time mix and so and then thank you very much and again of course mentioning this uh and of course that's what eric mentioned about then so yes we do make very small batches so we uh the batch was like uh, like maybe 10 to 12 jars uh bottles and then we put that uh date here and the date it's not expiration date it's the date when we make it because uh, the time when you buy that um, varnish at least you know when we made it and so it's not like 10 years you know old one and so that's that's why we we have that yeah. thank you now the, one of the, one of the reasons why I personally like to use the Regal Res 1094 as opposed to let's say the Dammer or just using one of the acrylic polymeric or um, or the Laropol uh, finishing isolating is I want to make the job for the conservator as easy as possible and I want them to be able to use the weakest solvent to not damage the the surface of my painting because i know that uh the regal res 1094 which is a hydrocarbon uh varnish it can be dissolved today tomorrow and in 50 to 100 years which its lifespan is going to be what about 100 plus or minus years before you know it needs to be really needs to be removed um they can dissolve it with the same solvent which some of the other varnishes um you know once the dammer goes through, you know, uh, oxidation, polymerization, we need, you know, tooling, acetone, xylene, same for the acrylic, um, the, the acrylic and polymeric varnishes, which require really strong, aggressive solvents, which personally, I don't like making the, uh, the acrylic or the polymeric varnishes just because I'm, I'm a little sensitive because of my unfortunate gross mishandling of all of solvents. So now I'm super sensitive to it. And I, you open up a little jar of tooling and, and I'm just fumed yes. out of the whole, <laughs> I'm just yes. fumed out of the yeah. whole house. Yes. But what, one of the things that I've prepared, um, just to show all of you that these varnishes have, they do have pros and cons. I personally don't mind there being a lot of gloss and I don't mind there being lower gloss. I think that in general, I choose to use lower, uh, lower gloss varnish for a lighter painting and a higher gloss varnish for a darker painting. Okay. So what I've done is I've prepared an example to show what the glossiness is on a, on a panel where I've done, you know, a handful of plain air studies, which Great. I'll bring us through. Let's right. do that. So we need to switch camera to uh, one uh, screen. Yes. 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 Great. Okay. So I've prepared a couple of examples just to show I think everybody, whenever you, whenever is this upside down? There we go. Yes. Uh, whenever you, whenever you are testing different varnishes against each other, I like to, I like to make a, uh, a panel like this and I do strips of each of the varnish, varnish. I let them all dry in between. That way I can see how the varnish's appearance will look when it is, um, when it is on a dark or on a light surface. Because once again, I like to choose the, the finish of the varnish, which is purely aesthetic for the most part, where you might want a glossier varnish for a darker painting. So here I've used the Dammer varnish, which has a really nice um, gloss to it. Next to it is the Regal Res, which saturates the colors really well. So on matte varnishes like your Polaroid B72 um, or your B44, you're generally going to have uh, a more matte finish. Now, that I think is um, a bit more important. You look at how kind of matte those are. Yes. I think that's a little bit more important for those uh, light paintings as opposed to the dark ones where we really want those colors and those values to be more saturated. Here we've got uh, no varnish at all, as you can see. Uh -huh. That's, you know, as matte as matte can be. Um, here we've got the Contivar, the Laro Paul A81. Um, to the best of my knowledge, the Dammer, the Conservar, and the Laropol use the Tenuvin 292 as a UV stabilizer. Meanwhile, the Polaroid series use, um, George, correct me if I'm wrong, but Tenuvin uh, B327. We're, we're actually still using the 292 in oh, the, uh, okay. uh, 
in the um, in the polymeric and in the acrylic, we're oh. using a different um, a different stabilizer entirely. Oh, well, that's good to know. Um, so, one thing that you can do if you are a gloss junkie, like I used to be. Now, low molecular um, low molecular weight varnishes have the tendency to sink in. Meanwhile, high molecular weight varnishes do not have nearly as much of a tendency to sink in. So if you are doing the very poor thing of using lots of solvent like turpentine or mineral spirits in your paint, if you're using very, um, you know, pigments that have a very high oil absorption, um, for example, your, your clay-based pigments like umbers and siennas, sometimes your umbers will have the tendency to just suck up varnish. Using a low molecular weight varnish, can, you can sometimes deal with patchiness. Now, a good way to remedy that is to use the Conservar Laropol A81 as an isolating layer. Now, that is going to essentially seal the surface and it's going to allow your low molecular weight varnish like your Rigores 1094 to sit on top and get a nice glossy second layer. Now, some of you might ask, well, why can't I just use two layers of Regal Res? And I, I would say the main reason why I use Regal Res 1094 is because I want it to be easy to remove with the same solvent that dissolved it because it doesn't cross link over time. Now, if you've got a small paint, if you have a small painting, you might be able to get away with doing two quick layers of the Regal Res 1094. On the other hand, if it's a bigger painting, you'd find that trying to do two layers of Regal Res 1094 um, with a brush, you'll get a lot of patchiness because the same varnish that you're putting on is that res, that synthetic resin is dissolved with the same solvent, and that's going to lead to parts of that uh, layer one varnish getting dissolved and clumping up in random areas, and that's obviously not ideal. So if you really want gloss but do not want to deal with the um, the shorter lifespan of the dammer, ideally, in my opinion, I would like my painting to be varnished and not touched by other human hands for as long as I as it possibly can. So the, the lower or the shorter lifespan of the dammer makes me back off just a bit, even though I love, 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 love the way that the dammer looks. I will opt to use the Conservar Reverse 1094 because it's just a bit more of a responsible choice in my opinion. But if you really want that gloss on a bigger painting, larger painting, that is the main use for your isolating layer, layer using the Laura Paul um, Conservar 881. So yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch, switch the cameras back. I hope everything that I said was proper and correct. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. yeah it was very, very good explanation, Eric. <laughs> so, like I said, you did all our job. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm a little true. obsessed. I lose sleep over the idea of my paintings being destroyed by someone other than me um, in the future. <laughs> well, that's so great. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great explanation. And um, so, yeah, that's... Um, uh, so... Since we uh, since we were talking about different uh, sheen, and, uh, can we switch to this camera, George, for a second? Eric, uh, we will go back. I'll be here. So, I will yes, be here. Yes, please don't <laughs> don't. Oh, I can I can put everybody on there. Uh, I no, I have one big uh, painting. I probably okay, will I'll, not be. I'll switch you. Okay, <laughs> that that's good. That's enough. That's good. So. <clears throat> So here uh, I have, this is uh, Denise, uh, I do believe Denise Wada. Uh, she, uh, so she, she was one of the, our students, what we had six days class, painting best practices class. And so she brought, uh, students were bringing uh, their paintings to, uh, to show how different uh, uh, solvents will look like. And so here I, I, I you see here's the mar and i will show you the sheen so here's no varnish at all so here's the mar varnish here's one layer of larapal and you can see how steel matte uh is here here on the very uh last strip it's regal res so again just uh, uh one layer of regal res but here right in the middle 
we have uh, she had one uh, layer of Laravel and the second layer of uh, Regal Res. And you can see, again, this is board, you know, and uh, so there are no canvas on that board. And so you see how different every layer look like. Where I have another one painting, it's another student uh, brought. So uh, it was uh, Linda Curley. And here's another. So. Here, this strip is the mar varnish. And you see, and so, and here's Larapal varnish. Not big difference. It's interesting, yes? So, and here, so then here's uh, just one layer of Regal Res. And here's uh, one layer of Larapal and second layer of the Regal Res. So you can see how glossy that looks. And here we were talking about acrylic varnish where usually it's uh, uh, quite matte, but you can see so how glossy that one looks. Like. And here's no varnish at all. So, and it's, again, that's what um, and uh, Eric was talking about, and that's what we are uh, saying then. Every painting will look different. Thank you very much. And uh, so every painting will look different. Oh, now we switch even. Uh, positions Look at <laughs> are we uh what is it um uh, uh music uh, yeah, musical uh, chairs chairs yeah. yes so. anyway so let's uh let's cover now and that's important by the way that's an important point that you brought out and and i'm sure eric has this experience uh because different paintings each varnish will look differently on the on these yeah. paintings yeah and and that's an important consideration and that's why it's so important for artists to do tests like this initially so they for can us, figure out what they really want. I can tell you this. For us, imagine we had uh, one uh, one class, we had 12 students, and another class, we had uh, 13 students. And imagine all of them had different paintings. And uh, so all of them had the opportunity to put all kinds of varnishes to play with them. Wow, that was range. And so and that really how it was visible for us. Uh, as a you know because i'm not an artist and so uh, i was trying to explain every time on class how it's look like but it's uh, really important <clears throat> to see once and uh, so to understand then how every varnish uh, uh, looks different for your application and then eric let's uh let's have a questions Okay. okay, so let's. So, uh, we got this one question here. I'm gonna can, put this. Okay, can, we should probably start with most common questions. This, this but, is okay. actually up okay. Here. <laughs> okay. So, um, how many months to wait before using uh, varnish in your paintings? In general, this uh, as a general safe, safe. I would say the same thing that many of us know: six months. At the same time, there are many caveats to that. Now, I personally use linseed oil based paint for the for the most part. Rarely do I use, you know, paint with walnut oil, but I like the iodine, the iodine value of, you know, a high acid linseed oil. I like the benefits of it drying quick and it's uh, it's drying hard and still flexible. Now, I also choose to use pigments um, that are reactive where possible. That's opting for lead white for the, there's, there's many benefits to lead white that I won't get into, but lead white is a good example of a reactive pigment, iron oxide based pigments. Um, avoiding things like high carbon blacks, like lamp black and my, my, my dear love bone black um, and genuine ivory black, I've had to be responsible, although I love using genuine ivory black and, gen and bone black. The, the fact that they're poor dryers and the fact that they have negative attributes in cracking, it's just made me switch over to using a natural earth-based black because I can do just about the same stuff. If, it, if I need to make it more transparent, I can add some crystal leaded powdered glass or some um, amending pigment to get a similar transparency without uh, without changing the value of the black mm -hmm. much. But I, I choose to use paints that I know dry well, have minimal cracking, 
and also dry pretty quick because I've got lots of paintings to do. And it'd be nice to, you know, on the next go around, be able to paint on them sooner without having to rely on sicatives or dryers to do that. So my paintings actually dry pretty fast. So I could varnish my painting in, you know, three months if I were using all highly reactive earth tones with, you know, the manganese and, you know, raw umber, um, lead white number one, lead white bound in a high acid linseed oil. Um, so if you're, if you are painting in thin layers, your paint layer is going to go through its process of, um, uh, you know, of, of much faster. oxidation and polymerization much faster than a very thick, hefty layer. So I'm not using very thick impasto. I'm usually using thick impasto in my under paintings, but I let those paintings dry at least a month before I even choose to paint on them after, because knowing that the paint layer or that layer of paint is going to swell and then shrink as it goes through its process of oxidation and polymerization, um, I want that to uh, be minimal so that my paint layers on top don't crack because of the fluctuating you know, size or volume of the paint. So at the end of the day, you can varnish a little bit sooner than six months if you are if you set up your palette right. Um, there's also things that you can do, like for your underpaintings, opting to use an alkyd-based paint for the earliest layers. I think that's a proper method of painting, building up layers, making sure that your fastest drying paint layers are underneath and that your slower drying layers are on top. But I think following those principles give you the confidence to say, you know what, I'm going to varnish my painting at four months as opposed to six and not lose sleep over it. So there is a, there is a slight gamut and range, but I do think that it's important that we as artists are being responsible, not only for um, our own reputation, but for the benefit of the people who are owning our paintings and for the ease of the conservators that don't destroy our paintings, um, trying to figure out what's going on later. Not that the conservators are going to destroy our paintings. Or if anybody's not going to destroy it, it's going to be them. But we want, so, I personally want to make it as easy for con conservationists later. And I want my, I want the people who own my paintings to know that I have put in a high level of integrity in my own work and doing the, um, I mean, it's exciting to me to do this research, it's not exciting it for everybody else, but that's why we do things like this is yes. because we can put yes. it on a platter for you. But you know, that's, that's the main, that's my main kind of it. See every time, uh, like, uh, of course, uh, everything what, uh, Eric mentioned. So you can, of course, to go to paintingbestpractices.com and find the classes there where we saying because he brought a lot of big words there so what they mean so then you can find that definitely on painting best practices but if to say just very short so then uh every time we, we're talking about artists are buying the cheapest grounds and then spend hours and hours and hours on the painting and then after that, they say, they, how many calls we have weekly when people call? And I was like, I just finished, but uh, next week I have the gallery already uh, showing my, my painting. And then they, they put in varnish. And it's like, everything is wrong. So you spend in hours on the painting, but two of the most important layers, what you had, the ground and the varnish, is just completely screwed up so then please don't do that so it's uh why we are saying six months because it's all scientific proven and so again if you need uh that information we have that information and so but six months maybe a little bit early but let's go <laughs> yeah. next question the way <laughs> nope that's good that's good so the next question george will Next question here. There's quite a bit of questions. We'll get to all of them. But um, um, uh, Dennis, this is a good question. And uh, Dennis, do you have any thoughts on how to alter your products uh, to make a matte finish? And I think, Eric, you, uh, you, you know, you um, uh, outlined something there um, in regards to um, you can dilute it. 
you were trying to, of course, in your case, you were trying to make a glossier, but and you mm -hmm. added resin. But uh, of course, the opposite is also true. You can add more solvent, and you can end up with a more matte finish. Um, and then uh, I don't know, uh, um, Eric, have you ever? Tr uh, you're you're always looking for a, a gloss varnish or a gloss finish. Have you ever tried you, a matte finish like with maybe uh, wax uh, applied no, over? No, to tell you the honest truth, I, that's that's one thing I was like, well, that's cool, but I never, I've I've never, I, I just like the way that my values. I I put a lot of effort into the values and the mm -hmm. saturation of the color, the chroma of the color in my paintings when I do it, and I find that using a matte varnish can sometimes make the Negative. values and colors less saturated or have there being less contrast, which is why you see Monet and a lot of impressionists um, not varnishing their paintings because they liked how it unified or, you know, the um, diffused light did not increase the contrast of the colors and gave it a more kind of uniform atmosphere. I don't like that as much because I want I want the value range that that I had when I painted it, but yeah. You know what? Uh, it, I'd like to show uh, one of the videos that Eric supplied to us because yes. that I think really helps to uh, yes. demonstrate what you just said. That's a good so let time. me just let me flip over to uh, let me see here. I'll flip over to this. Oh, and um, geez, I'm gonna take okay. you out of Thank that. You. <laughs> <laughs> so. See if I can get this. Oh, okay. wait a second. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. There we go. There we go. <laughs> and so you can see how, you know, matte the painting is. And then when you put the gloss varnish, what a difference. <laughs> yeah. What a difference. It's, it's really amazing. And then um, that's, that's very, a lot of very ball. apparent, of course, mm -hmm. obviously, in, in your... Um, uh, in that uh, painting, much darker. And then... Um... Is that it with us? Yeah. Yes, oh, yes, yes, yes. Sorry, okay, I, okay. I, I'm sorry. I'm I didn't sorry. know if it was my time to, to, to <laughs> chime in. I'm just scared in. to lose uh, you. <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt. One yeah, thing that we that didn't talk great. about is the brush choice. Avoid using very thick, um, heavy, uh, heavy, like hog bristle brushes that will have the tendency to you know, shed their hair, but using a thin, soft brush is, you know, most ideal. Um, one of the things, you know, in regards to, you know, how I varnish, I'll usually start off with a vertical stroke and then I will do a horizontal stroke mm -hmm. um, to just even out any of those ridges. I also don't mind um, using a using a small jar because when I when I wipe, I dip my brush into a small amount of varnish and then I wipe off. Now, when, when you use a kind of a circular jar, what happens is it, it removes a little bit more varnish from the far edges of the brush, which usually if you have too much varnish on the edge of your brush, what happens is you get these little bead or these puddles. So I actually like to use a smaller circular jar because it removes a little bit more varnish from the edges of the brush. So when you actually put your brush down on the surface, there's a slightly higher quantity of varnish in the center of the brush that gets pushed outwards towards the edges. I find that that gives me just a bit more of a uniform coverage. That's a good point. That's a really good tip uh, and um, uh, for artists to use. So that's great. So we'll show this, this, this last one here and um, and please don't pour your varnish to yes. your painting. This, this is the most we horrifying. See, we see all these videos, people pouring the varnish on. Yeah, using the bad brushes because why to use good brush? Doesn't make sense for these people. And then they picking up the hair and uh, trying to um, to take out these bubbles from uh, from what bad uh, brush will bring to you. And of course, Eric using our Rublev brush. Uh, Which is it's, great, uh, this way. brush is made uh, in Germany. And uh, so we designed it uh, specifically that 
that brush uh, for our now, varnishes. And one very important thing when it comes yes. to brush care. Yes. You should have a brush for Regal Res. You should have a brush for Laropol. You should have a brush for your you know, acrylic varnishes. You should also have a container that you would typically swish your brushes in if you're that type of person that's swishing their br brushes in solvent. You should have a, a container of the solvent that dissolves the varnish that you're using. And you know, I have one cup that's just mineral spirits. Um, that's high flash mineral spirits, high evaporating or fast evaporating. And I will clean my I will clean my Regal Res brush in that a few times. After a while, I will dispose that varnish. I will call my hazardous waste disposal and you know get a pickup you know at my home. That way, I can get rid of those things and don't pour them down the drain. Um, but the main thing is you want to be cleaning your varnish brushes with the same solvent that dissolves the resin be for obvious reasons. It dissolves the resin. So your varnish brushes will last forever. Essentially, you're, you're abusing them so little that you really should only need one for each type of um, varnish that you're using. So you brought a good point. Uh, and so the longest time for, uh, for example, for Larapal, since it's different, it's a mixture of the uh, uh, solvents. So we didn't have that solvent separate. So now we do have, and so you can find on our website, it's called Larapal solvent. So then it will be very clear also what what's that solvent because we do have obviously turpentine we have rublisol we have rublisol light and so then now we do have uh, larapal uh, solvent so a great point and probably would be great uh, question to ask because that's the uh, question usually people ask what is the varnish so what's the components of the varnish and so would you, do you want to answer? Uh, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. The, the varnish is very simple. Uh, the varnish is very simple, like paint should be simple, pigment and oil. In this case, we have resin that can be a natural resin or that can be a synthetic resin. Living in the 21st century, I don't see much of a need to use natural resins because um, they will oxidize just so much quicker. Um, and there's just negative attributes of, of natural resins compared to um, all of the time and effort and energy that people have put into the, you know, the really complex chemistry to develop these resins for the paintings that you love and admire on the walls of museums. Why not use the same? Why not use the same uh, resin? So you have your resin, you have your solvent. Now, not every resin can be dissolved in, you know, the same solvents. So. There are some resins that need to be dissolved in, you know, almost 100% aromatic solvent, others that can be dissolved in low aromatic solvents like mineral spirits. But uh, the main thing is your, your varnish is made up of three main components. You have your solvent, your resin, and then your UV stabilizer, which is going to help extend the life of that varnish and decrease the time it takes for that varnish to yellow. Great. That's absolutely great. And so again, so I want to remind you, so then uh, we do have the sets. So we do have sets for Regal Res, for Larapal and for Damar. And so the Mar varnish, it will look even uh, uh, funny. So we have a bag inside the, the jar. So then it will be dissolved and do not give all kind of crap what uh, the, the mar has yeah there's usually a little <laughs> bit of sticks and dirt and it's a natural resin so i mean yes. they're getting, they're getting yes. a tree is getting slashed and they're just collecting collecting the yes. resin so there will be little yes. bits of dirt and everything that has nothing to do with natural pigments or rubble no. it's no. just natural it's <laughs> it's in the name natural yes one just one point that I, I wanted to bring out to clarify for everybody because everybody or not everybody but some people and we've seen some comments that some people think that the UV stabilizer absorbs UV light, and that's not its function. So the function of the UV stabilizer is to extend the life of the varnish layer, and it's not to absorb UV light. Now, UV light absorbers are used in clear coats, let's say for automobiles and other applications, but they are yellow compounds. Uh, and so 
And that's why they're generally not used in artist varnishes because they are yellow. So they would tend to uh, make the varnish a little bit yellow. Not, not so apparent on a car. Uh, because of the uh, because of the you know the intense colors that they're being used and uh, there. on our set we have tinuvin in uh, right in this small teeny bottle so because you don't need you don't want to add a lot so it's again so specific amount here how much you need and uh, uh, I know we had a question before about so if you are varnishing much later let's say so we do have artists calling and say like you know what i finished my painting uh five six years ago and then now i need to varnish what to do so you do need to clean the the uh your painting and so we have good um, uh good product for that uh, for that picture uh gel it's okay uh, do you need to to? Uh... No, I was gonna go. I was gonna go get the mini pitcher cleaner. Oh pit. yeah, yeah, I have it here. So look, okay, you good. have everything. Okay, yeah, I, I, I've got all the bells. So and I've have, got all the bells and whistles. Yeah, we do have set and set uh, has um, uh, so the the bottle of the gel picture uh, cleaning gel. We have uh, ruby soul and we have a ionized water and uh, mm -hmm. we have the paper uh, sandpaper. Not send paper. This is send, it's a micro -mesh. Uh, send micro mesh. Yeah, it's yes. a micro mesh sheet. And, uh, so, so everything the, the... what you need to clean, but that's for aggressive cleaning. So then usually we're saying then, so if... if Simply just, dusting is just, usually, that's all yeah. that's required. And dusting with a brush. But um, yeah. uh, you'd be surprised when you clean in with the gel. And so uh, we had several artists uh, are trying on their old painting, even if you can clean, like even if it's varnished. And so then they wanted to clean that uh, because our environment is so apart, <laughs> looks like very horrible. And so that's what mm -hmm. we'll be breathing. And of yeah. course, um, our paintings are um, taking all that dust and dirt and uh, so it needs to be clean. Very so important to not clean your painting like a barbarian as well. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, okay, here's Jason. So Jason has a question. Since both dammer and mastic varnishes are soluble in tur turpentine, why have I heard that they are more difficult to remove than modern varnishes? Will turpentine still remove them, but is it difficult? And that's a really great question, Jason. Um, the reason, and, and I think Eric's mentioned this too, mm -hmm. is that uh, natural resins like Dameron Mastic oxidize and cross-link. And as a result, the original varnish used to dissolve the, the natural resin can no longer remove them. So as it ages, the varnish requires more polar solvents and what I mean by polar solvents, these are solvents like acetone mm -hmm. or alcohol and, and which are far more aggressive on oil paints um, and, and, and paints in general. Uh, and so that's why they're more problematic to remove. And so... Um, so Again, we covered that on a previous uh, session on May uh, 12, 2021 about... So we talk about why is that happening and... Um, and if you want to, if you need to know more, painting best practice is there. <laughs> Here's another good. Uh, oh, uh, Victoria. Victoria. Hi, Victoria. Um, so she has a, a question between what is the difference between an isolating varnish and a final varnish? Do you want to answer or I answer? <laughs> I can answer. Who wants, who wants to answer? I think we all can answer. Uh. <laughs> so, uh, so basically, your isolating varnish or what you know that uh, other companies are selling, it's your diluted regular varnish, and uh, so. Um, but people. But, take... but the important thing to understand: it's not so much a varnish as much as its application. How is it applied? So, so a varnish, any varnish can basically be an isolating varnish. If you, for instance, make that the first varnish layer and then you decide to put another coat, then that coat is the final coat and the first coat is an isolating varnish. Again, that's why we, we usually when you call to us, we are telling you the, uh, the great strategy would be to put Laura Paul first 
because it is different uh, resin than regal resin top so then and theoretically every each of them have 100 uh, years of the life and so imagine if 100 years later um, restorer will come and take your uh, regal res first you know <clears throat> that uh, varnish which cleaned very well very easy very well and with uh, not as damaging uh, solvent so lara pile still stay put and hopefully by 100 years they will figure out something else and they can put another la uh, layer on top of your lara pile which still will stay put and protect your var uh, your painting yeah who knows so in 100 years they may have little magic robots that use lasers and just <laughs> take off that first layer and never actually touch the painting That's, yes that would be remarkable yeah <laughs> uh, you need to think about how any solvent anything what will be re uh, in restoration will go it it will go through your painting and how that will damage your painting so you need to think about that uh, first before you even touch in any varnishing and god forbid if you actually do retouch varnish in between the layers and turn your whole yeah. painting to a puff pastry um, and that, as those varnish layers as well. You know, Eric, again, so we talk about this last, I don't know, 13, 15 years about, so please people don't do, and the, there are some still people, they, they learn that from their teachers. And they're, uh, you know, it's very common. Uh, or when Ralph people, Mayer. I mean, that oh, one. Ralph of Mayer, just, just so, coming back. Just coming. Yeah, and again, uh, just simple physics. When imagine if you put your varnishing in between the layers, 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 and so you you come and you uh, oiling out with varnish, and so, and then you put final varnish, and when uh, restorers will come, or you varnish with bad varnish and something didn't go very well and so you need to remove that varnish and just you know that happened very co uh, often too people work on painting they put the varnish they didn't like how it's look like they want to remove that and when you removing this solvent seeping through the your uh, layers of the paint and everything just puff pastries they can Swallow, no, swell. Yeah. Swell, swell. 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 Yeah. swell. And yes. Here's terrible. another um, another question here. Um, let me see, I'll put this. This is kind of an interesting question. B B72 will turn gray over time. Does your polymer varnish have UV stabilizers in it? And what is the solvent for that? And I can answer that very easily. I'm not aware, by the way, of B72 turning gray. Um, so it'd be kind of interesting to see Monte, where uh, where you got that information, but the B, the polymeric varnish does have a UV stabilizer in it, uh, and again that uh, even though uh, B seventy two actually has uh, it does it does tend to cross sink a little bit over time, but it actually has a very good reputation uh, in in the conservation field, and the solvents that we have to use for it uh, is a is a blend of a high flash aromatic solvent and a mineral spirits uh, because it does require a little bit different blend of solvents to get it in solution they just made it it is an excellent varnish one of one of the things by the way um going going back to the isolating finishing idea is one way to use a varnish like dammer uh, is actually to put an isolating coat under uh, as the first layer choose like a maybe a b72 or uh, or uh, the uh, isolating finishing varnish, which is the Laurapol. Put that first and then use the dammer on top. And always keep in mind that the final coat determines the appearance of the varnish layers. So even if you have a lower gloss varnish on the bottom and you put a high gloss varnish on top, it will actually be very high gloss. So, uh, and, and in that way, when it comes time to remove that dammer varnish, uh, the isolating layer, as, as, as Tatiana mentioned, will help to protect the painting. And, okay. uh, and it actually, and the fact that- I the, think Eric that, wants to say something. Yeah, go ahead. No, Eric. no, no, that's, that's a great idea. I mean, yeah. that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great idea. So it's, you know, these are different strategies that, you know, one can use because sometimes we want to get, you know, and, and very important by the way, and I'll mention this only because I know this is going to come up if it hasn't already, uh, tempera painters. 
Yes. Big issue with them is how do you varnish a temper painting? And the problem there is that any varnish you use becomes part of the painting because the, the temper layer is so porous. So any varnish you put in sinks into the temper painting and that's it. That's, that's non-removable. So uh, a B72 uh, uh, acrylic varnish is actually a very good isolating coat for that and then putting on a final varnish any other varnish you want on top of that. So okay. good point there. Um, let me see here, uh, going down here to, uh, oh, this is uh, this might be good. Uh, Victoria has another question. Best for a painting that has a lot of black in the background. So I guess I like the best I like, I, Yeah, I like, I like Regal Res 1094. Um, that's my go-to. That's I just might go to. I think that you know the the high saturation quality of the dammer using the uh, using an isolating layer underneath it. Now that you know the purpose mm -hmm. of the isolating mm -hmm. layer, Victoria, um, that that's another great way to get a lot of saturation of color and value mm -hmm. for a dark background. I personally, I'm just a Regal Res type of guy. Um, that's usually what I use is Regal Res. You know, uh, on uh, on our website, uh, we have uh, people uh, commenting every time they, you know, rating the products. And so, and uh, a lot of ideas we actually um, reading from uh, from our customers. We, you know, once you give the product and you give the idea how it should be, but artists are artists, of course, they are using whatever how they think they it should be used and so like for example we had uh, one customer which is great idea we thought so he had an even uh sheen on uh, on certain uh, parts of the painting so what he did so the basically the where was uneven he used Larapal just on on that areas and then he took uh the uh regal rest and paint uh, and the uh, uh varnish all together and it was on the end, it was all uh, same sheen. So they're like, you know, we. There's lots of ways to do this. Yeah. 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 I'm going to add. This is a this is an important question um, that a lot of people have. Is uh, what kind of sprayer would you recommend for applying varnish to a large painting? And um, I don't I don't know if Eric if you've had any experience with using sprayers, but. I know Not that in, in the conservation world, uh, they, they use what they call an HPLV sprayer, which is a high pressure, low volume sprayer. Okay. Okay. And, and, <laughs> and the purpose of that is you don't want a sprayer that applies a lot of material onto the panel, but you do want a high pressure delivery. In other words, you want, you want those, and, always, and keep in mind that, you know, the, the little droplets of varnish are, traveling across you know this the airspace and as they do the solvent is evaporating from that from that droplet so to avoid getting what they call orange peel you actually have to use more solvent and most manufacturers recommend somewhere between 10 to 20 percent added solvent to, to because, the existing because typically one. we make varnishes for brush application Mm -hmm. So just, uh, and just uh, uh, it's actually since you you started to talk about the big uh, big applications and so I I just do want to remind you we are a small company uh, but we absolutely love to work with uh, with artists you know one to one and so that's why we we have great artists calling us and they they uh, we are making special batches not only varnishes but even paint. And uh, uh, I mean, yes, sometimes it's uh, quite expensive, but uh, talking about varnishes, it's not. It's actually more you, you buy, uh, we will give you a better, um, better price. But what I wanted to say then, because very often people say like, oh, it's only four ounces. Again, if you paint reasonably, like reasonably small, big or whatever, uh, it's enough for some time. But uh, we do have artists who paint huge paintings. And so then you just call us and we will make a special batch. Uh, we just don't want to make this gallons and, uh, you know, just because it's cheaper and then it will be stained in years and years and years. And then, you know, it, it, it doesn't work like that. So you have a special project. 
you need big uh, big amount of varnish call us uh give us at least a week because um uh you know usually people call and say like i need tomorrow and we can't i mean even if we can't produce for you that that as fast but we can send you because it's solvent and uh, uh it's uh, it's going by air of course i mean the by ground ground we can send it uh, by air so then just plan in advance everything every step of your painting okay here's a good question okay are there any varnishes that don't require ventilation <laughs> no at this time yeah no no, no. that's that's one of these uh, areas <clears throat> we always joke about so then if uh if we will find the pigment other than lead then it will you know be as great so we would switch immediately and uh if other way uh, we can make a varnish without varnishes without solvents we would unfortunately not yeah not, not oh i've got an i'm sorry to yes, yeah. i've got a very i've got a very important point preparation of your studio your space to varnish one the what i do i save all of my varnishing for one time so i will gather up 10 paintings to varnish all at once i give my studio the deepest clean i have a hepa shop vac and then i wet mop everything not a speck of dust I, this is then i clean you know then i clean my paintings and then i do not varnish in that day i leave a, a hepa filter on for a handful of hours and then i leave my studio i shut the door i close the vents and i try to not disturb the air at all Thank and you. then I slowly creep into my studio, bring the painting out, varnish it, put it in the safe space, closed, um, where there's once again, no dust and do that for all of them. And then I sneak out of my studio. Um, so it's a, it's a couple day break, um, you know, or it's one day I, cleaning, one day know, of break. Great point, because we have people calling us and they're saying then, uh, something went very uh, wrong and we are asking what and so they're saying they brought the painting from garage they they applied the varnish and it's all or beaten up or it's you know uh, going completely wrong or blooming you know and it's like oh, they're varnishing outdoors oh yeah we have <laughs> that too. High humid, 100 percent high humidity it's like rain starting coming <laughs> so um, yeah that will do it and so then people call us and saying like how to remove that so good then we have all kind of solvents to remove that but still not not good when you work so long and then uh you need to do that so okay it's not let's great. move on a little yes, bit there's yes. a, I, this is a good question yes. what's what's the better method to apply varnish on thick textured paint brush strokes do you have any recommendations eric i know your paintings I, are, I, are quite thin in terms of i do have some thick paintings yeah. i think it's best to obviously since your painting is thick give six months is, you know, minimum, <laughs> you know, I, I'd like to give my painting even longer in a nice safe space where it can be exposed to light um, and, you know, moderate airflow, but make sure that your painting is terribly dry because I would suggest using, um, I like to have one brush that has varnish on it and then one brush that has varnish on it that I've taken all the varnish off. Uh -huh. One is to apply the varnish in kind of a, um, almost a scumbling, a very gentle scrubbing manner around the texture. And the other one, which has some varnish on it, but most of it taken off, is there to sop up any puddles that might be um, existing in the low um, regions of your impasto. Great. That's great. That's Here's great. A, a, a question from Marie for, for Hi, Eric. Marie. Can Eric talk about the varnish's ability to even a sheen of paints used like some sinking in or glossy, glossy areas. Oh, Josh, uh, can you put oh, I'm back? sorry, yeah, let, me, let me put that back. I took it off too early. So uh, <laughs> if you can talk about uneven sheen and, 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 uh, and how to correct that. He doesn't that. have that, see? I, well, I, <laughs> yes, yeah, no, I do everything I can to avoid that. Okay, so I think that prophylactically, dealing with this prophylactically is the, the, best, the best choice. Now, um, this is what I do, and this what this is what allows my paintings to be completely even. You know, the the matteness when my painting sinks in, it's you know all completely fat. Regardless, 
of whether I'm using a lead oil ground, an oil primed linen, I'm definitely not using an acrylic primed surface ever. Um, but if we are, if I'm using a lead oil ground, just a regular titanium um, oil ground or an oil primed linen, um, I'm it's always adhered to an ACM panel. That's either a solid um, poly, you know, polyethylene core ACM or corrugated polypropylene core ACM. Um, what I do is I first start off by making sure that my underpaintings lack mineral spirits. I may do a Campitura or an Imprimitura with some mineral spirits, but that's primarily to degrease and clean any dust or dirt off of my surface before I go and tone it with a very thin washy layer. Now, I do not add any mineral spirits to my paint when I go to tone my surface. Um, I just uh, hurry up and do that before the, all of that mineral spirits has evaporated from my cleaning session. After that, Mineral spirits is out of the, you know out of my studio until it's time to varnish. Great. So throughout all of my layers, I like to add very small amounts of copolymerized or polymerized linseed oil when I'm when I'm getting my paint to the critical pigment volume concentration. Now, when you make your own paint or when you use paint without stabilizers and additives. Sometimes you go to spit the paint out and you'll go, oh, it's lost all of its oil. And you might be a little bit perturbed in that moment. But I look at that and I, and I kind of have to say, yes, it's happened. Because I want my paint that I get from Natural Pigments Root Buff, which when it's made, it is at the critical pigment volume concentration. But if you're sitting on that one tube for eight months, it's obviously gravity is going to start to separate the, uh, the pigment from the oil, depending on which pigment it is, certain pigments that doesn't really happen for an ungodly amount of time. Other ones that will happen much quicker. Now, I like when I get some pigment oil separation because that means my paint is very lean, meaning the pigment quantity is too high for the quantity of oil. Mm -hmm. Now, what I do there is I supplement that with whichever oils I choose. That can be a higher acid, you know, like the pale grinders oil, refined linseed oil. That can be um, an epoxide oil that can be a vacuum bodied linseed oil. I prefer vacuum bodied linseed oil as opposed to the closed kettle. Um, but sometimes I like the lower viscosity. Nowadays, I like to use the epoxide, especially in earlier layers where I can kind of promote slightly faster drying. But the addition of those uh, polymerized or co polymerized oils, which are different sizes of polymers, monomers, uh, your paint is not going to sink in quite as much. That's why when you're refinishing wood furniture, the finishing, the finishing oil varnishes are usually bodied oil. So I like to use bodied or uh, vacuum bodied linseed oil or a copolymerized linseed oil like the epoxide oil throughout my painting process in very small quantities to reduce sinking in. Now I get my viscosity of my paint correct and the spots at the top of, you know, stop at the top of my um, batches. I keep that at the critical pigment volume concentration through the entire painting. And then I've got the question, but what about glazing? Don't I need to add, you know, three liters of oil into it, into it to glaze? And I, you know, jar a bit and say, no, it's the opportunity to add transparent pigments like, uh, like fume silica, crystal leaded powder glass, barite, you know, calcium carbonate, any of the other kind of amending pigments to help give a little bit more transparency. And ideally, I glaze with transparent pigments to begin with. I don't try to make a very opaque pigment that's very small in size, more transparent just through the use of amendment pigments. But that allows the oil content or the, that my paint is at the critical pigment volume concentration throughout the entire painting process which makes it to where I don't have to think about the fat over lean principle and follow more of a principle of slower drying over faster drying or softer, um, more flexible over harder and more stiff. That's why earlier I suggested you could use an alkyd or fast drying reactive colors earlier in the painting and then perhaps slower drying colors um, at the top. I see the question. Are you oiling out in between the layers? Oh, see? Over time, I've learned to paint just bad enough. In other words, if I look, I can, I can look at anything in Alaprima, I can do an Alaprima and make it good to go. 
the hard thing, the conundrum here is oiling out where buffing the painting sometimes I, I feel damages it, you know, so sinking in happens because the oil quite literally gets sucked into the paint layers underneath or the absorbency of the substrate um, or the absorbency of, sorry, the absorbency of the substrate and the absorbency of the ground. Grounds mm -hmm. typically have calcium carbonate in it, which invites some of that oil to be sucked into it. So even, uh, you know, a pure layer of lead white is not an ideal ground. You need some absorbency there to, you know, let the paint bite into that ground. Now, the conundrum here is when you do a dark painting, it gets very matte. So that oil gets sucked in and that, that reveals a micro rough surface, which diffuses the light. So if we apply oil onto it or varnish onto it, that makes that more uniform. And then we've got, you know, a better refraction or re reflection off of that. So the oil layer is a little bit more uh, uniform because it's covered with that. Now, what I do now is I paint in layers and I am purposely keeping my painting harmoniously underdeveloped mm -hmm. and stepping the painting up for 90% of the painting without oiling out. Because I know that it's wrong. I'm not trying to be too correct too early in the painting, which means when I look at it and suck it in, all I have to do is shrug and say, well, let's, let's do it again. It was fun the first time. It'll be twice as much fun the next time. It's only when I come to the very, very end where I feel a somewhat, um, I feel that oiling out is some, somewhat of like the necessary evil. Now, the thing that I do is I apply a very small amount of linseed oil or oleo gel, which is a mixture of ole uh, which is a mixture of linseed oil and fumed silica. Um, I apply a very thin amount of that and I try to wipe as much of it off with a makeup sponge that does not have any infused vitamin E or anything. So there's a very, very thin layer of oil. Now, I will only oil out in the area where I intend to paint. I will not oil out a very large area because I am terrified of unpigmented linoxin, which is just a straight oil, yellowing unpigmented on the surface of the painting. I want to avoid that. So I only oil out in the section that I plan to paint and I will paint every last inch of where I oiled out. I would never leave an area where I oiled out left alone. I will make sure that I paint into it. And sometimes what I'll even do is I won't try to float my layer on top of the, um, the oiling out. I'll actually kind of apply it with a bit of a scumble motion first. If any of you follow me on Instagram, my Instagram is easy, Eric Johnson artist. Thank you. You'll see videos of me painting and you'll sometimes wonder it's like, why is he always scrubbing at his paintings gently in the beginning? And that's because if I've oiled out or if I'm just applying the paint, I tried to use, you know, a stiffer brush to move more paint as opposed to relying on, you know, decreasing the viscosity using oil or solvents. I want to rough up and mix my paint in with that thin layer of oil. That way my, my layer of paint isn't floating on top of, you know, a, a little buffer of straight oil. So I worry that that could have negative attributes, but yeah, that's, that's kind of how I deal with it. I only oil out towards the very final layers and I'll go piecemeal piece by piece by piece by piece. And I'll oil out just what I think I can handle in a few hours span. And then I'll oil out the next area and the next area. Okay. I think we're going to have to bring Eric back again to yes. get more into this. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> it's Definitely. The, it's it's uh, dive over to you at 1130. A lot of good information there. <laughs> yeah. Um, Looks so like you will be our warrior girl now. <laughs> so <we're, laughs> yeah, I, yeah, you don't have to threaten me with a good time. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like uh, we're, we're, we have gone over time, but I'm going to try to get a few more questions in because I think they're really, Let's do quickly. Um, they're really important okay. if we can get to these quickly. I would like to do um, um, oh. Mikovic. Um, and so... Uh, this kind of a long explanation see. here, Mikovic uses, he paints with an egg oil emulsion, uh, the Velasquez, our Velasquez medium handmade paints, and he doesn't use any solvents. Uh, he lets the painting dry one year or more, and he cleans the painting with a soft, dry brush. And then for varnish, he uses dammer thinned with natural turp with turpentine and a little alcohol. Uh, and it's very thin and applied in, in four layers. Is this okay? Any suggestion? 
and um, I guess you should answer. Yeah. So um, it's again, you know, the the uh, dammer is actually is a very good natural resin, and it does have lots of uh, very good gloss. So and and I and uh, Mukovich is in Europe, and um, they do have, of course, uh, a number of synthetic resins. Our resins are our varnishes are not available yet in Europe. We hope to have them available yeah. in um, uh, uh, probably late this year. Um, but uh, but overall, yes, that's fine. Again, just keep in mind that uh, Dammer will. Dammer is supposed to have a lifespan of about 25 to 50 years. Um, and according to Dr. Rene Delary, uh, re now retired uh, conservation scientist, who actually developed the formulation for the Regal Res varnish in 1991, uh, also tested Dammer with a, a Tinovin 292, which is a UV stabilizer, and found that under accelerated conditions, Dammer can actually last a hundred years. Now that's a theoretical accelerated light conditions, but with the caveat that the painting is not exposed to UV rays. So that's the caveat there. So, so yes, I mean, we, I cannot condemn the use of any kind of varnish material, even mastic, but every artist has to understand that uh, the synthetic, re I'm, excuse me, the, the natural resins do yellow and will become brittle faster and are much more difficult to remove, uh, requiring polar solvents as they begin to age. So just keep that in mind because again, you know, the whole point is varnishing is, offers some protection, but most importantly, it's an aesthetic choice and that's why it's so important. So um, I just thought I'd answer that, that particular question yeah, but lots of people um, from all over the world. Yes. <laughs> um, and, uh... So let me see. There is, uh, this is another good question. And I think, um, I think uh, Eric can help us with this one. What about using a spray retouch varnish after finishing the painting to get a sheen before a show? And of course, that's, <laughs> so, uh, so it's often, rec so it's often recommended if you can't wait this, the, the uh, recommended six months, you know, what do you do? You have to, you have to put something on the painting to get it ready for the show. That's uh, the, you know, that seems the to question. be a common problem for artists. <laughs> they seem to be in a hurry at the last <laughs> for shows. And um, then it's um, every time, remember we are saying plan ahead. Yeah, but. That's, that would be my answer is um, <laughs> you messed up. Uh, <laughs> if, it, you th think of it this way. There's really, there's a lot, there's negative things that can happen to the varnish. There's negative things that can happen to the painting. I've, I've done that before, not exactly for a commission, but I varnished a painting right when it was touch dry. And typically I would think that when you varnish too early, the painting is still going to go through fluctuating, you know, you know, fluctuating in its size and crack the varnish. I had the opposite happen. I have no idea what varnish. I was probably 17 or 18. So, I mean, goodness, God knows what I, what I, what actually I varnished it with. I think it was something from Winsor Newton, but I varnished it and it cracked my whole painting. And my painting was still just, it was a thin layer and it was not fully dry. And the, what I used for the imprimatura um, or the campitura was probably very heavy in oil, which did not allow my, overpainting to grip onto it and my varnish just shattered my painting like in like a you know like an old painting that's dealing with lots of cracking from mechanical failures uh, luckily the the color of the campitera and the painting it, it, it all actually worked out really well and it actually looked pretty good but I would never try and do that on my own uh, but bad things can happen and the last thing you want to do is ruin the piece that you uh, worked on. The best thing is don't plan ahead, like like was said. And the good, don't... The good part is for uh, isolating varnish. Uh, I mean, not good part, but something, at least something. So because it's not 
uh, supposed to be a lot of resin, so it would be more you're talking about uh, isolating or re retouch like varnish. Retouch varnish, yeah. yes. Retouch. Yeah. So, so then it's easy if if you screwed up that badly, so then you can remove it. But that means uh, suddenly, George, I hear you're getting miss, echo, yeah. uh, So then, uh, while you're removing. So then that means you need to wait again more time. And so then uh, it's kind of like 50 50. It's um, uh... the point. What a retouch varnish is, by the way, is simply a diluted varnish. Yes. And um, typically, however, retouch varnishes are really used by conservators when they do in painting, because the idea is they put a little retouch varnish in the area where they're going to do in-painting. They then do the in-painting, which allows that, that retouch later. to be removed easily. See, yeah. that's, that's really the idea of a retouch varnish. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's not something artists typically want to be using. However, having said that, uh, this is a big issue for a lot of artists. And of course, the, the best thing is to plan ahead. That doesn't always work out. And so... Um, using a varnish uh, that is well diluted and, and applied very thinly can offer not protection uh, like a regular application of varnish, but, just a little... but maybe uh, alter the appearance for the show and can be removed later. And, um, and a Regal Res uh, varnish is, is, is probably, if I, if I were to recommend that, and, and I'm not recommending doing this, but uh, I know people were going to, you know, they, they, in fact, I had a call from an artist last week who had that exact same problem. And, uh, and this artist, you know, exhibits worldwide. And, and so we walk, we walk through it. And then I, and of course I told him all of the downsides of doing, doing these things, but, uh, yeah, it's just not There's, a good thing, but yeah, tens and thousands, your, your, your risk, you know, you, you risk things and that's what happens. But, so. Okay, um, um, I think uh, because it's already uh, one, it's eleven thirty. One last question here, because okay. I think it's I, I I think there's some artists actually attempt to do this. Uh, can you use resin as a varnish? And I think what what uh, uh, Inji. her name Inji is is referring to is something like art resin or epoxy resin. And, <laughs> and and based on Eric's eyes right there, Imagine you can, you can the see questions that, that we have. Didn't, didn't even, yeah. Absolutely would never want to use an epoxy resin as a final coat on a painting. And, and why is that? It's because good. it is not removable without, of course, destroying the painting. So, yeah. yeah. So and it very will yellow very like fast and so but anyway it's um and we will put yeah. uh eric's um in in the in the description of, on the youtube channel as well as in facebook we'll put eric's contact information because a lot of people have asked about yeah that. now people will call you and instead of <laughs> us get good advice <laughs> on varnishing i'll bear, I'll bear the weight of some of it <laughs> But you can see uh, uh, Eric is, is a great teacher. He's got a lot of great information. Yeah. Not just obviously about painting, but mm -hmm. about materials, which is actually, I can say you right now, is rare among many artists who have good background in materials. And and I, I, I don't know, Eric, would you say it's because you have made paints and that gave you, you know, some greater insights? I, I mean, I'm, yes, making paint, falling in love with the craft, I think is what, you know, what, what did it for me is, yeah, I really tried to start from the be from the beginning, reading, you know, Pliny the Elder and going through all the treatise, all the treaties, treatises, um, and realizing that that doesn't, my, my, my limited chemistry background at the time is like, that doesn't make sense. You know, and I worked my way up to Ralph Mayer and, you know, worked my way up to, uh, to just reading, you know, Joseph conservation Hamlet. articles. <laughs> but yeah, making making my own paint, trying to do things in the way that the old masters did was uh, was the first the, was the first step. Getting used to actually manufacturing pigment, making my own stack lead white. I've made my own I've made my own lead tin yellow, um, which is a, which was really fun. Cool. But 
you know, I, I've made a lot of my own pigments. I've processed my own oils, uh, you know, and, you know, that's what's also led me to you all is because now I don't want to do all that stuff and I can have as, <laughs> yeah. as, as good as it was if I made it, if not better, just by, you know, buying paint and paste form and knowing that I can trust a manufacturer where all of many other paint manufacturers, I mean, it just didn't, I, I couldn't couldn't trust the information that they weren't giving me. So that's, I think, the the way that I've built up myself as an artist is I know that materials and the craft go hand in hand. You know, it's like before the 19th century, there was no flat brush or a filbert or a fan brush. It was all round. So if I'm going to do a 17th or a 16th century master copy, I should be using time-specific materials. If I want to put myself in the same um, environment that they were painting to achieve the same effects. And just over many years, um, all of these different aspects of the, the, the craft of picture making, painting has, you know, they've, they've all just kind of played off of each other. And I've got my own kind of aesthetic ideal, uh, you know, ideas about how to build up a painting to strengthen the illusion of space and the effect of light. But yeah, so it's, they, they all, I feel that they all play off of each other. And, you know, the best I think the best thing that you could do as an artist is to just be very inquisitive, you know, in of, of our own kind of reality that we live, because it's a we are, we're doing a visual, you know, it's a it's a visual craft, copying what we see or doing what we imagine based on the visual limitation of what we have, but also the the scientific aspect of making a painting is uh, is you know it's it's a it's it, it's exciting. It's very interesting if you let it be. If you're just looking at materials as, ah, I don't want to know that. Then, you know, you you miss so much exploration and paint and good experimentation. Hopefully, you start off with good experimentation with good information that's going to allow your painting to age well, and make the people who collect your paintings and buy them for thousands of dollars very happy to know that you know what you're doing because you can get sued for for, you know, selling paintings with inferior, um, inferior materials or doing random things that end up destroying the painting. I mean, a collector is collecting it for the long term um, because they love it or because it's an investment. I think it's important as artists to have a high level of integrity and everyone should put their best foot forward. And, you know, hopefully 30 years from now, there's going to be more artists that are suggesting more scientifically correct things I, as opposed to you know to... here's uh, you you pointed so like when we started 20 years ago with uh, uh with iconophile and natural pigments nobody was talking about this uh, nobody and so and now it is it's refreshing <clears throat> to see how people are interested in and that's that is the craft which was bad word then and now it's uh, even today uh, believe me, uh, some artists still think then it's it's bad word. <laughs> so craft, but, yeah. craft. yes, <laughs> craft. <laughs> anyway, um, good. Thank you very, Thank much. You very much. And uh, so uh, let's do me. not forget about promotion today. So then we have the code, coupon code Conservar, and that will work for next seven days. And so it will be twenty percent discount on all our varnishes and varnish kits. And uh, so I hope you can try it. So that, that would be, um, you know, good opportunity for you to, to try uh, several of varnishes and see what, which one works for you. And I truly, truly appreciate today uh, Eric's help. And yeah, thank uh, you, Eric, for joining uh, us. Thank you for having it's me. It's just a uh, just great, great session. And so then we definitely will bring you back because it looks like we I will... <laughs> we'll talk about some we'll talk about else. other subjects. That yes, really great. and yes. Uh, so uh, <laughs> thank you everyone being with us today, and uh, thank you who who was uh, from the beginning to the end. But whoever missed that, so then you can cheat and go uh, right on the end, <laughs> or uh, or if you did miss the opportunity to see the different uh, all our different um, uh, range of the varnishes, it's the very beginning of the the video, so you can uh, look at and so and if it's not enough for you information, go to May 12, 2021, a guide to varnishing, and so that even more information there. Thank you very much. See you next AMA.
Yeah, thank you, Eric. Okay, thank bye, you. everybody.